it was a very visceral form of art where people were going out. They didn't have a great deal of time. You couldn't, you couldn't get a cherry picker and stay there for two days paint a piece. It was like, I don't get this done in under five minutes, then the chance of me getting arrested is high. Now they have the time to paint whatever they want. They have the time to paint a photorealistic portrait that's 100 feet high. Whereas historically, they never had time to do that. Like, we got chased off every single building and street in Shoreditch over the years. For some reason, everyone's corralled themselves into making murals instead of doing like graffiti or tagging or throw ups. It's like there's so little vandalism happening nowadays, it's terrible. It, it's not what it was. The mere nature of it being legal, being asked to do it, and being given permission changes everything. Some years ago, I got into trouble writing a defence of street art for a London newspaper whose readers saw painting on the wall not as art, but as crime. Now, London councils do their best to preserve the most famous pieces, and works by street artists hang in galleries alongside Matisse and Picasso. How did this happen? How did an art that was so hostile to the exclusivity and high prices of the art world become so collectible. This area has undergone many remarkable transformations. It was once an industrial area, a warehouse area. Then it went into steep decline. The artists, of course, are usually the pioneers of gentrification. And there were lots of speculators who were sitting on the properties around here waiting for the values to start to increase. And they were happy for artists to come in and make the area cool. If we think about the origins of street art and graffiti, especially in New York in the 1960s and 1970s, it was very much associated with subcultures, with uh, local and resistant communities. It was seen by many as an authentic expression of dissent. It was a resistant claim that this city is ours. We have the right to decorate it. The early street art was usually very ephemeral. In particular, the decorated trains in New York, many of which were really remarkable. We only know about those because of some very dedicated photographers who would spend hours waiting, hanging around railway bridges, waiting for these things to pass because they would be cleaned off the very night uh, after they were made by the cleaning crews. There was lots of competitive coding going on. And so there were layers of the way in which it operated and the way in which street artists were competing with each other, which were not very open to the public. Graffiti often served to make areas resistant to gentrification. Middle class people might look at street art and feel scared. This was you know, a sign that these streets were not theirs, but were claimed by other people. Street art now has become much more accessible, much simpler in many ways, much more spectacular, much more large scale, uh, and it speaks very directly to a public. In the past, if you wanted to make a large piece of street art, you had to find somewhere pretty quiet where you were not going to be disturbed um, and work on it often with a crew so that, uh, you know, many people working together could do the piece re reasonably quickly before they were chased away by the police. Now you can see a piece like this, the scale of it, the fact that it's very detailed. This shows you that street art is more than tolerated. Someone has had time and leisure to do this, perhaps, you know, over a number of days. Aside from the signature, which is kind of street RT, this looks like an apocalyptic sci-fi book cover or something like that. There's nothing very street art about its style. So the gentrification of this area coincided with the point at which street art became mainstream, cool and acceptable. A lot of the people that collected stuff in the other days had never really collected art. It's like he, he was their first entry point 
not just him, but this general form of art really did open up the world of collecting to a whole new kind of church of collectors. One of the things that fascinates me about Banksy is that, in, in a way, the contrast between his advertising techniques yeah. and his, uh, you know, the way in which he fixes on images of celebrity and all of that, and his, his socialism, really, his sort of left-wing instincts, his uh, anti-imperialist yeah. uh, propaganda. One of the things that made him so popular was the fact he was putting out this very simplistic political message mm. out on the streets. And in fact, his wife at the time was very funny. She, she, she described it as nothing more than sick form politics. Yes. <laughs> However, you, you know, he's coming up with like very simplistic things about you know, incredibly complicated issues. But this resonated with the public mm. massively. So you had people from, you know, ex rear gunners from the Second World War through to like five year old kids that all kind of accessed it and got something out of it. The, you know, like the soup can, the queen, there's lots of things that people kind of accessed almost instantaneously and then realised that you put a spin on it. Yeah. And I think he made it okay for the general population to like art. For a long time, uh, street artists were very hostile towards the art world. They said, well, artists make very high-priced things, they hang them in exclusive galleries, places where we don't feel comfortable going at all and are not made to feel comfortable when we go there. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're toys for rich people. We, on the other hand, make art for everybody, right? We decorate the streets and our art is free. Now, in this competition of all these branded artists striving for distinction, it's more like the gallery scene. This had been shunned up until very recently, sure. and even yeah. now, you know, you've got the upper echelons of the art world that hate it because it's populist. Yeah. I really wanted to ask you about your start in all of this, because you were, you know, <laughs> um, you were a photographer, right? I was, yes. I got commissioned to take Banksy's photograph. We got on quite well, and I'd get a text message to say that he'd done a piece and what I'd go and take a picture. And that was it. Was our kind of relationship was born from there. And then one day, he went in and picked up all these screen prints. I'm like, what, what are you going to do with them? He said, oh, I'm going to sell them for a fiver at the Anarchist Book Fair. <laughs> and I'm like, in that case, you're an idiot, and I'll buy them all for 15. So we then struck a deal to set up pictures on walls, which was really where it all started from. It was to make cheap, affordable art for the masses. And we just made stuff up as we went along. It's a, my, my thing is, like, the art was all smoke and mirrors anyway. They, you know, if there's a handbook, then I, I've yet to see it. So we just made the prices up as we went along. So, well, this is what gallerists yeah. do anyway, isn't it? I mean, who knows what, what, my, what my, anything costs yeah. until you sell it. There was three price points, mm. $49.99, $99.99, <laughs> and $129.99. Those canvases that were $129.99 are now worth four or 500,000 pounds. But the big Russian collectors or the big guys in the city weren't coming to buy it because they couldn't turn around and say, oh, look at my piece that I just paid a million dollars for. So this work uh, takes Nikut's famous napalm girl, Kim Fook, and uh, it juxtaposes it with Ronald McDonald and Mickey Mouse. But this now um, framed, signed, yeah. has become quite an expensive commodity. Would you like to tell us how much? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what it was originally. So mm -hmm. originally this would have been 150 pounds. And that was 12 years ago. It's now 22 and a half thousand pounds. And for something that's as hard a picture as that is, because I think that that's a tough picture, you know, to hang on your wall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you're someone that's obviously trying to say, say something about yourself by buying this piece. But yeah, 22 and a half grand is a lot of money. Yeah. We had what I would consider the true collectors mm. that came in, in the early days, which was, you know, people where it was, you know, had done their homework and their research, and it wasn't just, it wasn't right. someone coming with a shopping list and going, yeah. I want a Murakami, I want a Warhol, I want a, I want a basket, and I want a Banksy, which I think now, now the case. I think he's now moved in to that sure. group of artists where people yeah. are like, they're coming with their shopping list to the auction houses yeah. and going, yep, yeah, I want one of these, one of these, and one of these. Yeah. The prices of the prints really got dictated by the public mm. rather than the galleries. So how much would you pay for this um, signed Banksy print? Well, so this set of six that originally was sold for £12,500, not uh, £12,500, 12 years ago they sold, would now cost you at least a quarter of a million wow. for six bits of paper that are very badly printed. 
we, we really didn't know what we were doing back at this point in time. It's, it's quite bad when you start having a look at them again. It's all about the image. And the brand. And the brand. Build it and they will come. <laughs> what really changed, I think, was digital photography and social media. Now it was possible to make a piece of work, and even if it was cleaned soon after or overwritten or otherwise damaged, you could still have a record of it and you could still make that record of it available to a wide public. And so it became possible to build up identities uh, of yourself as an artist, as a branded artist in fact, because so much of you know, the most famous street art is highly recognisable as a signature style of a particular um, artist. I mean, the piece behind us here uh, by, well, his name is Stick, right? And you can tell why. Really, it started kicking in for us in like 1999, which is when websites and everything were just starting to really mm. be known. Mm. And, you know, if you think these guys nowadays, like I was with JR yesterday. JR now has a million Instagram followers. Wow. Right? Mm. Name me one museum or gallery in the world that could give that kind of exposure to an artist. You know, I don't understand why the Tate Modern has not done a show about street art. You, you know, in fact, they did many years ago allow the street arts to paint the front of the building, but wouldn't allow any paintings on the inside. And we actually tried to donate works to the Tate by those artists, and they refused them. No, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, that's very fascinating to know, because I did talk to a Tate curator about this very yeah. issue, uh, who was saying, yes, on the outside of the building, fine, but on the inside, they're not there yet. Yeah, it's just populist. It's the lowest common denominator. You know, this is, if this is populist, then great. Yeah, it means it's getting out to millions of people. It's getting a message out there. It's showing kids that it's okay to be an artist. It's showing kids that you don't have to come from a posh background and go to a private school to be able to succeed. I think like, all these things are great messages. And if that's populism, then bring it on. I think there's something about certain strands of populist art, and particularly street art, which in a very conflicted and, and difficult way, they're trying to come up with an image of the people, I think. It's people's faces over and over again that get reproduced. Ordinary people looking back at you. If one thinks about the previous ways in which the people get represented, socialist uh, renditions of the working class, that doesn't quite function anymore. We can't rely on those old modes. And I think that something that street artists are trying to do is both to appeal to uh, an amorphous but non-elite mass and to depict them. Mm -hmm.